Hello, hello, hello. This is Nicholas on this lovely Friday afternoon. First asking you, what underwear do scientists wear? The answer, of course, is Kelvin Klein. Anyways, oops, whoa. <laughs> what I wanted to talk to you all today about was area vectors of a tetrahedron. Uh, more specifically, I want to show... Well, first, let's define what an area vector is. See, this tetrahedron has four faces, and we define an area vector to be a vector perpendicular to a face. Say, in this case, this face here, uh, with a length equal to the area of that face. So there are four area vectors in a tetrahedron. And I'm going to draw them now. That one that I just drew goes out the back. And then this one down the bottom. And we want to show that these four area vectors for any tetrahedron sum to the zero vector. Um, and now what should be kind of going off in your mind if you're given this question is cross product, right? We're dealing with vectors perpendicular to something else. Uh, the cross product will give us just that. So let's label some sides here. Let's call this side vector A, vector B, and vector C. And this is really the whole side, you know. I just didn't draw it all. Now, uh, what? how could we write the area vectors magnitudes in terms of these three vectors? Well, uh, for this face right here, the area vector would have a magnitude, one half, of, or the area vector would be given by a half a cross b. Uh, and it's a half because realize that the, uh, we could do it like that. Well, well, we'll ignore the magnitudes. It realize that it's a half because the cross product, the magnitude of it, gives you the area of the parallelogram spanned by a and b, which in this case would be, if we were to continue it like that, imagine on the bottom, but we only care about the triangle, which is half of the parallelogram, so we divide by two. Now the next vector that we would get would be a half of B cross C, right? And that would be this face here. And then the last vector would be a half, or I'm sorry, the third, the second to last vector would be a half C cross A. And that would be this face, whoa, <laughs> that face there. <laughs> now, we still have one more face, right? We still have this face in the back here. How are we going to write that face's area vector in terms of the three that we already know? Because ideally, we would not want to uh, introduce a fourth side vector. You know, we only want to deal with as little unknowns as possible. And three side vectors seems like a natural choice because really the tetrahedron is made up of uh, faces who have three sides, right? It's made up of triangular faces. So, well, one thing that we could say is if I can figure out how to write this vector and this vector in terms of the three that I already know, uh, then I can just take the cross product of that, of, the, of those two vectors. So what would this vector be? Well, I know that uh, vector... A plus that mystery vector, which I'll call vector D, it would be equal to vector B. And so then vector D is just B minus A. And then what would this vector be? Well, I know that vector A plus that mystery vector, which I'll call E, would be equal to vector C. And so E is going to be C minus A. And so that fourth area vector would be given by a half C minus A cross B minus A, those two vectors. And now we want to show that that sums to the zero vector. Now all of these have a half out front, so I'm just going to, well, I'll keep it in there, why not? We have a half, so we have A cross B plus B cross C plus C cross A plus this C minus A cross B minus A. And the cross product is distributive, so that's 
plus c cross b minus c cross a minus a cross b plus a cross a. Now that's going to be a half and then some nice stuff is going to cancel out here. We have an A cross B and an A cross B. Those go away. We have a B cross C and a C cross B. But realize that C cross B is just negative of B cross C. In other words, the cross product is anti-commutative. And so those cancel out as well. And then we have a C cross A and a negative C cross A. And then also realize that any vector cross with itself is the zero vector. And that should make sense because the magnitude of the ve of a vector crossed with itself would be the area of the parallelogram spanned by the same vector, which would just be a line. And so the area of a line is, of course, zero. And so we get a half of the zero vector, which is just the zero vector. And we're done. Almost. One other thing I'd like to point out is that uh, you can get mixed up here with the with the signs of the cross product. See, subconsciously, I chose a coordinate system that was what we call uh, right-hand ordered. In other words, it followed the right-hand rule for the cross product. That being, um, I usually write it like this. That being, it follows the usual convention that I cross J is K, or J cross K is I, or K cross I is J, or, or so on like that. Um, and so the cross product, while it is anti-commutative, in other words, it adds in that negative sign when you flip the order, um, in cycles, right, in cycles of uh, A, B, and C, or I, J, and K, it works nicely. And so I wanted to define my vectors in the original problem in that cycle. You see I have an A and a B, a B and a C, and then a C and an A. And so in keeping my system right-hand ordered, uh, the signs worked out well, and we ended up getting the zero vector. Um, and in a couple videos from now, I'll show that this is actually not the case for, that this isn't a particular property for a tetrahedron, but is actually a much general, much more general consequence uh, as a result of uh, Stokes' theorem over manifolds, Stokes' theorem over manifolds. Um, and in particular, it's true for any closed n-dimensional surface. Now with that,